Well, in 1 Samuel 10, uh, we, we got up to verse... Um, Oh, let's see. We got up to verse 9. 1 Samuel 10, verse 9. I'm going to back up to verse 7 to kind of get a... Well, I'm going to back up to verse 6. Uh, 1 Samuel 10, 6. <clears throat> we have Samuel that is speaking unto Saul. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. Verse 9. And so it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him, and then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Verse 14. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? And so he said to look for the donkeys. And when he saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. And so Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. So we need to remind ourselves a little bit on what we finished with this morning, what is made uh, mention of beginning at the start of the chapter of chapter 10. Remember, uh, Samuel had sent all the people home. They had demanded a king, and God said, give them what they want. Uh, and God was going to choose the very best hope they had in that generation to be a good king. Uh, Samuel did not know who that individual would be, but God assured him he would let him know. Uh, so we've seen that there was uh, words from the Lord that uh, this would be one of Benjamin and that uh, he would meet him at a certain place at, at, a, at a certain uh, time the next day. And everything happened just as Samuel had been told. So let's back up a little bit to 1 Samuel 10, 1. It says, Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? And what we have to remember is that uh, Samuel had sent Saul's servant away, and this is a private conversation. So we have Samuel, and we have Saul, and we have the Lord. And he is going to anoint him before God, because this is a job that he will answer to the Lord. Now, we understand that we are responsible and our life affects other people's lives, but it's always our first responsibility is unto the Lord. Uh, we each have a, a life to live, and it will affect other folks, but it's the way it affects God that is the most important. It's hard to imagine just how much Jesus enjoys uh, a meeting you on a personal level and ministering to you one-on-one -on -one and then living his life through you that you would be a blessing unto others. The goal is that Saul is going to be this first king, that he will be a good king, that he will be a blessing to his nation, that he will cooperate with the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, that God will be glorified in his actions, that the Lord will have a freedom to flow through him. Uh, this is uh, the hope of Samuel. This is the, the goal. Now, so it will depend on how much Saul is willing to cooperate with the Spirit of God. 
Saul starts off extremely humble, and that's a good place to start because you need a lot of grace, God's uh, free unmerited favor to the undeserving. You need a lot of grace, especially if you're going to serve in public office, and there's about to be this change in government, switching over from this government of the judges to the government of kings, and they're going to have to lay a new groundwork, and they're going to have to have a new tax system, and they're going to have to raise a standing army, and things are going to be different. Uh, there was, it was not uh, the right timing, but it was the demands of the people, and God says, go ahead and give them. Certainly that they would have a king had been prophesied through Moses, uh, and we've been several times back into the book of Deuteronomy, that 17th chapter, and we see now the fulfillment uh, where the people goofed is they made demands against God, and they wanted their timetable, not God's timetable. And the Lord uh, told Samuel, go ahead, prophesy to them what these changes mean and what it will cost. And, and they still wanted to be like all of their neighbors. They were having a really tough time, the nation was, because they thought that they could worship other gods and also worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they, they could worship the, the neighboring gods and be like the neighboring nations and still be true followers of the Lord. And you can't. There, there is only one God. You cannot serve two masters. And one of God's titles is jealous. And if there's a boy, one thing that will really mess up your relationship with the Lord, if you try and add another God to worship while you try and worship Jesus, you are going to be messed up spiritually. You are going to have some real spiritual problems. Uh, and they tried to do that as a nation, and it does not work. So they were always having to be called back to this separated life unto the Lord, to renounce the false gods and to renounce the false prophets and to cleanse their hearts and to serve God alone. It is still a temptation for God's people to try and add other gods or other things in their life that's more important than Jesus. And so the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation was congratulated for the many things that they got right. But there was one thing that Jesus rebuked them on, and that is that they had left their first love. That Jesus was present, but he was no longer supreme. And he says you, you need to watch that heart attitude, that you acknowledge that he's there. But something is more important. Something takes priority. Something takes precedent. And it's a dangerous place to be spiritually. It can really rob you of power in your testimony. And, uh, and uh, it, the, when you begin to compromise your walk. So if nobody else brings it up, Jesus will always bring it up because he loves you like nobody else. And anything that would hurt your walk and your relationship with him, your fellowship with him, uh, he will always bring it up. He, guard, he guards that jealously. We have, uh, we have God making it clear to Saul that he is the choice for the first king of Israel. Uh, Samuel prophesies to him. Samuel anoints him. It is a private conversation, and yet you and I hear every word. It is a private conversation, yet you and I hear every word. Do you understand? There's, something, there's some sort of principle here because uh, Samuel will write this at a later date. He does not write it immediately, but he will write it at a later date under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And God will say, I want my people in every generation to hear this private conversation. What was said is you were anointed and the signs that were given unto Saul to confirm to him that Samuel's not a nut, that Samuel's not a false prophet, but that he is a true prophet, and he speaks under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so there are some very specific signs, uh, very detailed signs, that have to come to pass uh, in the order that they are spoken of, in the number they are spoken of, and in the timing they are spoken of. And let's just remind ourselves, because we had to read through fairly quickly. Verse 2 says, When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. They will say to you, The donkeys which you went to look for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? 
And that happened exactly the way it said in the, the, at the timing and in the location. And then it happened exactly. Verse 3. Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree at Tabor. There three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. That happened exactly. Now, there has to be that many people with that many items. If all that happened and they give them one piece of bread, one loaf of bread rather than two, it's not of God. In other words, every single detail has to be right. The order has to be right. The location has to be right. The number of people has to be right uh, for this to be God. And it happened. Remember, these are the signs that are to confirm to Saul that he's about to make a dramatic change in his life. He's not going to be basically farming uh, for his dad, even though his dad is a powerful man. Now God's going to set him aside as king and will supernaturally equip him by the Spirit to be king. Let's keep going. Verse 5. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Specifically, you can tell they'll be prophesying in song, which was very common. Way David, you know, we remember David as the second king of Israel, as the one who is a man after God's own heart. We remember him as a mighty warrior. We remember him uh, as, uh, uh, as a great king. We remember him as a writer of songs. But he is declared to be a prophet. Remember, David was a prophet as well. And many times David prophesied in song, which we have as psalms. We don't have the music anymore, but we have those words. And that was not uncommon to come into God's presence in song, and then the Holy Spirit would begin to speak forth a word for the people. They would begin to speak forth uh, that which the people need hear. There was a, a declaring forth of the mind of Christ, the word of God to those who are round about. So this was literally fulfilled. They, it, remember, these things had to happen in the correct order, at the correct location, in the exact way that is said. If we keep going, verse 6, and this is where we picked it up tonight, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. In other words, God's going to change your heart. God's going to change you. You're going to experience something in the presence of the Lord you've never experienced, Saul. The Spirit of God's going to come upon you, and out of your mouth will come forth the Word of God. You will be singing with them. You will be speaking forth the word of God. And you will have never done that. But this will be God preparing you, giving you every opportunity to be a good king. Verse 7, let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Verse 8, you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So after these events, he says there is a certain location. He's going to have to take a trip to Gilgal, which is going to be south of, of Jericho. And he says, uh, you're going to get there early, but I want you to wait. I want you to go to this location. And I, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to wait. You know, Saul is about to be given delegated authority from God where he'll be able to issue orders and people will, will be expected to obey. But you have to learn to take orders before you give orders. If you cannot learn how to take orders, you can never be a good order giver. And so uh, the thing that Saul needs to learn early is that he must answer daily to God Almighty. Remember, the one thing that will happen is there will be a, a, a copy of the scriptures that they had up to that point, copied just for him. And he is to have his personal copy, and he's supposed to study it every single day. Uh, I'm sure this could be a bit overwhelming. We've already been taught that Saul looked like a king. 
In other words, the people were very responsive because when they saw him, he's a head taller than everybody else. He's a head and shoulders guy, man. I mean, he looks like a king. He is athletic. He is tall. He is handsome. Uh, and so they think, this has got to be the guy. I mean, th yeah, this is what we want. Uh, I'm sure glad we didn't end up with some four-foot-two pygmy out here, you know, that's going to be our, our, uh, our king. You know, this guy looks like a king in their mind. This is what a king's supposed to look like. He's supposed to be tall. He's supposed to be athletic. He's supposed to be handsome. And then God equips him in the spirit, uh, and God will show him favor. Saul starts off very humble. Saul starts off scared. How can this happen? How can it be? How can he handle this? How is it, how is it going to happen? And God assures him, I'm going to equip you. I'm going to be with you. Uh, it is clear that God is the one who is in charge and that Saul must be able to take orders from the Lord before he can give orders to others. He must receive from the Lord before he can be a blessing unto others, before he can be a champion for others, before he can be a warrior for others, before he can defeat their enemies. He's going to have to receive from the Lord. You and I learn the same truth. You know, it is in daily fellowship of the Lord that you and I must receive the Word of God. We must receive God's will. You and I have nothing to give to anybody else unless first we receive from the Lord. Every day we need to receive from the Lord, then you've got something to pass on. But if you think, uh, I, can, I can just minister anytime I want to uh, in, in the power of the Spirit and to give out, that's not the way it works. You're going to have to receive from the Lord on a daily basis to be able to have something to give out unto others. Uh, and he's going to have to learn these truths. Verse 9, So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. God changed Saul. You know, the only way to change a man's character is to be born again in Jesus Christ. That is the only way. You, you have to be you, born anew. You have to be born from above. The, there, there has to come that God can change people from the inside out. The only way to strengthen a man's character is to keep him grounded in the Word of God. So only God can change a person's character. I, I can't do that. Uh, God strengthens our hearts, our, our spirit, in, in keeping us grounded in the Word. Now, God gives you and I authority after we come to Christ to change our hearts. You know, uh, God gives you the authority to make yourself mad if you want to. You, you have that authority. Uh, you, you can make yourself mad. You can upset yourself. You can get down and discouraged. God gives you that authority. God also gives you the authority to be an overcomer. Uh, to be more than a conqueror through him who loved you so. That Christ in you is the hope of glory. That greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. But it, God gives you the authority. You can change your heart. Uh, you can't change anybody else's, no matter how much you want to, no matter how much you love them, no matter how you, you want to see them victorious over what they're struggling with. God being God can change anybody he wants to. And so he's taking Saul and he's equipping him. He's giving him every opportunity to succeed in this call that's being placed on his life. Uh, Saul is scared and he is humbled. And when his uncle quizzes him about what's happened since I saw you last, you'll notice when what we read, he tells him about uh, seeing Samuel and he tells him about where they searched for the donkeys and then being told they'd been found. But he doesn't mention anything about the kingdom doesn't mention anything about being anointed to be the king. He keeps that to himself. He just, he doesn't know what to do uh, with that. He just, he still hides it in his heart. If we keep going in 1 Samuel 10, 17, it says, Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adversaries and your tribulations, and you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. 
Uh, so there is this uh, casting of lots that's going to take place. In other words, there is going to be a representative from each tribe that will appear and a tribe will be selected and then there'll be a representative from each family and a family and then they'll, they'll take it all the way down to an individual. There has to be some way for God to demonstrate to the people that are present who is the one who is being selected to be this very first king. Uh, Verse 20 says, when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Now see, it doesn't mean everybody comes rushing forward and there's hundreds of thousands of people. You have a representative. You have a representative of each tribe. And so that tribe's representative is taken. And then a representative of the family. And it's, it is what they're referencing as the casting of lots. In other words, how do you, how do you choose uh, down to a certain individual? Verse 21, it says, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul the son of Kish was chosen. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment, or in King James, the baggage. There is a word of knowledge. Saul started off extremely humble, and he spooked. Uh, and he's hiding, because here his name is announced before the nation, and he's hiding in the baggage. He's hiding among the equipment. He doesn't know how to handle this. But they find him, and they bring him forward. Verse 23, so they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. You can see where our British friends picked that up from. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him whose hearts God had touched. There were those who were in that meeting. You see, uh, our government, a new government needs to be formed. This is, they've not had a national government before. They've not had a standing army. They've not had a standing location. They've not had, uh, they've not had a taxation program. Uh, they've, they've had none of these things. All of this is going to be added. So from among many of the tribes, there were valiant men, qualified men, whom God touches their hearts and drafts to be a part of this first government. See, God does not set them up for a fall. He gives them every opportunity to be successful. So remember, they are not only going to have the book that is prophesied in Deuteronomy, which is the scriptures, there is also going to be this book on how does this program work? How does this take place for royalty? So Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. From the very beginning of the founding of this government, there were those who were dissenters. There were those who thought, I know uh, who the king should be. Maybe they thought that even they should be the king. So when this Saul fellow who comes from, you know, uh, a tribe that had been shamed because of their history and it was smaller because of judgment that had taken place uh, upon it and he was considered to be least among his family, they, they didn't want to cooperate. I mean, there's a direct word from the Lord, and it's clear that he is the one that is to be chosen, and they wanted to cause trouble. Saul was very wise in that he just didn't say anything. He held his peace. God is going to have to prove through his actions that he is the right man for the job. And so no amount of speaking is going to do that. Actions are going to have to show. 
They're going to have to be able to meet those Philistines and overcome them. They're going to have to be able to form a government and to form an army. And so it will be their actions that will do the talking. So he was very wise in that there were those who despised him, spoke against him, but he worked with those who were willing to cooperate. In any endeavor, you have to go with the goers and leave the naysayers to themselves. You are never going to get everybody in agreement to move forward on something. Having confirmed from the Lord that which is God's will and God's word for you at that time or for that group, and, and by faith you begin to put it into practice, and you're always looking for that confirmation. Remember, truth is confirmed by two or more witnesses. You always want to make sure that things line up with the word of God and the timing of God and the heart of God. But having been convinced what God's will is and you begin to move forward, it is extremely rare for everybody to be in agreement. You're going to have some who will be very excited. They will be gifted by God. Uh, they will be a part of the move of God in their generation. And there will be those who despise you for moving at God's command. And they're going to uh, be very critical. Just leave them alone. You're going to have to go with the goers and leave the naysayers to themselves. And uh, time will prove if you're right or wrong. Actions will determine, you know, is it the way that you proclaimed it would be. And so no amount of talk is going to do that. It's going to have to be proven by lifestyle. As we finish up, we got just a couple minutes. 1 Samuel 11 says this, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition I will make a covenant with you, that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days, that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news and the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Because here come some of those Ammonites. Here come some of those Philistines. It says, Now there was Saul uh, coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. See, Saul, he continues with what he knows to do. Uh, he, his family runs a big farm. He knows how to do that. I'll tell you that he's already married at this time. He already has a, a son who is old enough to fight and to lead men in battle. And you'll get to meet Jonathan uh, a little later on. He, don't think of him, this guy is just a young kid. He's already got some experience. But at that moment, what was prophesied was when the occasion comes, God's going to come upon you and you will know what to do. And here we're having the first proof of that. He says, what's the problem? And the Spirit of God comes upon him, and there's a righteous anger, and he says, this will not stand. We are going to do battle. We are going to face our enemies. We're going to defeat our enemies. We're going to rescue our countrymen. It says, then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. And it was a holy anger, not a human anger. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. So the fighting men that show up are 330,000. And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. Then the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. And so it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day, 
And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. There was a great victory. There was a mighty victory. And that confirmed to the people that, yes, Saul is the one who is to be your first king. And there was not just talk now, but there was action, and there was God's favor, and there was the defeat of the enemies. The men of Jabesh never forget what Saul did. Now, many of you know the testimony of Saul, and you know the change that comes in his heart later on, and the struggles that he had in his spiritual walk. But the men of Jabesh never forgot what Saul did. And decades later, when Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle, and their bodies were abused and they were taken and hung up on display by the enemy, when the men of Jabesh heard about it, they went at great risk to themselves and they went in and they freed those bodies and they took them down and they gave a proper burial to them. And they did so because they understood that they owed a debt to Saul. It had happened a full generation previous. Some of them that went on that rescue mission had not even been born at that time. But they understood what honor was. And God was pleased with their actions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, though this is real history, we know there are some things that you would be saying to our hearts. And we just need discernment. What are we to learn? We're very thankful for your intervention on behalf of Israel and the anointing and empowering of Saul and the victory over your people's enemies. But Lord, we just we need an application. So Lord, as we think about these things, we're counting on you to just let us know what are we supposed to grasp and what are we supposed to live. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.